Hi, my name's Justin Hayek. I'm a lot. I'm an eternal pessimist, a gay Republican, a loyal friend, and an excellent schmooze. I'm a writer, operator, connector, and allegedly a macher. One night, though, I stumbled upon this old Jewish story of the Lamed Vav Sadiqin, the 36 anonymous good people whose work would redeem the world. I wondered, do they exist? Can people find them? Could their goodness rub off on me? Is there magic in this world that I just couldn't see? I couldn't resist finding out, so I set off to Israel with a mission. I was going to find these secret souls and hear their stories. We're calling this journey 36. You can find 36 and other podcasts from Soul Shop wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe now. This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. In collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. It is feared and revered throughout the world. Its operations have been igniting the imagination for generations. Its capabilities seem endless, from wreaking havoc in a far Iranian nuclear facility to assassinating a high-profile Hamas agent in his hotel room at the heart of Dubai, all according to foreign publications, of course. It is far-reaching, it is bold, it is legendary. It is the Israeli Mossad. Today, for the first time on the Two Nice Jewish Boys podcast, we are going to be talking to a person who was a Mossad agent. And not just an agent, he was the head of intelligence for the Caesarea unit, the special ops branch of the Mossad. In another lifetime, Mishka Ben David was a regular guy, just like you and me. Born in 1952, his story is Israel's story. He fought in Yom Kippur War and the War of Attrition, he studied literature at the University of Wisconsin, where he served as the delegate of the Zionist Histadrut. He was even working at the Matnas Company, which manages local culture centers in Israeli cities and villages. But all that changed in 1987, when he was recruited to the Mossad. After retiring in 1999, Mishka became a writer. His novels depict thrilling spy stories that might or might not be based on true events. We are super excited to have Mishka Ben David on the show today to talk about his amazing life, his books, and his service in the Mossad. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on your show. Before we get to the episode, we want you, dear listener, to ask yourself a question. What have you done these past two years? You know, the pandemic hit us all really hard. What have you really done other than perfect that matzo ball soup recipe of yours? Nothing. Now, we all want to add purpose and meaning to our life, and we just, we have the way to really, really make your dreams come true. If you're listening, you're likely interested in Israel with hopes of traveling here soon. Well, lucky for you, we've got the scoop on Masai Israel journey. With an amazing range of life-changing opportunities in Israel, Masa has many, many programs. They've got gap year programs, academics, internships, volunteering, and careers. The pandemic didn't stop them either, promoting options to study remotely while living in Israel. You don't have to be fluent in Hebrew or break your bank account. They even supply partial funding so you can make a positive impact on the world. You can fuel your passion and you can make your travel dreams a reality. Go to masaisrael.org and find out more. So we uh, we had a mistake. We'll probably edit it out so the listeners aren't aware, but we had a mistake. Did Was the rest accurate, more or less? Uh, more or less, except that uh, I wrote a few books before the Mossad. Ah, okay. <clears throat> before being recruited to the Mossad. Uh, I completed my PhD before being recruited to the Mossad, uh, and um, in literature. My PhD is in literature. My uh, in at the Hebrew University. Mm-hmm. I uh, studied for my master's degree at uh, the University of Wisconsin mm-hmm. in comparative literature, 
and uh, my BA is in literature and philosophy from the Hebrew. Okay, so, Mishka, what does it take to be a Mossad agent? It is uh, hard to pinpoint uh, a certain uh, capability that, uh, that one has because it's a combination of uh, capabilities that uh, sometimes they seem uh, contradictory. For example, you should be able to manipulate other people to do what you want or to believe that you are who you say you are, but at the same time to be very truthful, very trusty uh, and very accurate in your reports to your superiors. These are two um, elements that sometimes are conflicting as far as a person is. Uh, you should have both capabilities. Uh, for example, you, you have to be brave, but you cannot be too bold and too uh, hasty. Uh, you cannot do things that will expose you or will prevent you from coming back. Uh, you cannot be hesitant, uh, but at the same time, you should be able to take risks, risks that will not be uh, too big and will not uh, get you caught. Again, these are uh, elements of personality that may be contradictory. So a person that has all of these things together uh, may uh, be worthy for the Mossad to check him out. Uh, the fact that he has the right personality doesn't mean that he will fit for the Mossad. There is a very, very long process of recruitment it takes about a year where they check you out inside out. Yeah, through and through. To the guts. And um, those who pass this, which is about uh, one to 500 uh, people that uh, apply or that the Mossad approach them, um, start a, a course, uh, about an eight month uh, course which only about half pass. And uh, those who pass, which end up to be about uh, one to a thousand people, um, then at the end they get recruited and they get to work at the Mossad. So I don't know if, I, I feel like all of my answers need to be prefaced with, I don't know if you can answer this, but. <laughs> all your questions. All my, all my questions, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, did the Mossad approach you or did you approach the Mossad? No, I approached the Mossad. Uh, I saw a little ad in the paper. They didn't say the Mossad, unlike today, where they say in bold letters, the Mossad needs you. Uh, it was just a very small advertisement saying um, that uh, a government agency uh, is seeking for people who are uh, army officers, academians, and have a good con uh, command of a foreign language. And I had the feeling that this is the Mossad, so I answered. Um, I was called for a meeting in a, just a Tel Aviv apartment. And the very first question that they asked me was, where do you think you are? Or who do you think we are? And I said, I think you are the Mossad. And if I'm wrong, please don't call me again. And they didn't say yes, they didn't say no. But they kept calling me for more and more interviews and exams and then uh, uh, different drills that we did in the streets of Tel Aviv until I was formally uh, informed that I was accepted. Can you give us an example for such a drill in the street? Yes. Um, you go, or I went, <laughs> with uh, a person from the Mossad in the street. He points out to a certain balcony on the third uh, floor of some building, looks at his watch and says, in five minutes, I want to see you in this balcony with the owner of the apartment. I want you to keep him there for five minutes and then depart peacefully and come back here. So I was looking at the apartment, I was uh, at the balconies, I was looking around to think, uh, what, what should I say? And the guy looks at his watch and said, four minutes left. 
said, okay, I'm thinking. Then I saw that many of the balconies were renovated. So I came up with a story. I went upstairs. I knocked on the door. And there were two elderly people that wouldn't open. And I said, well, I'm very sorry because I'm from an organization called Eretz Israel Yefa, beautiful land of Israel. And we are renovating the buildings around here. You don't open up. We cannot renovate your balcony. Immediately they opened it up. Uh, up, took me to the balcony. I pointed out the balconies I saw before that were renovated. And I said, okay, you, you see this? This is more or less what we want to do in your balcony. And they started with different ideas. Uh, we would like you to do this or that. And then I see the instructor uh, at the street pointing at his watch. Five minutes <laughs> are over. So I told them, okay, listen, I have many more people to visit. Uh, thank you very much. Give me your phone number. We'll be in touch. And I departed and left. I'm so They're sorry for them. wondering where that balcony is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they died in misery. Like he promised. He, they say on his be- deathbed, the grandfather said, "My balcony." <laughs> um, wow, that's crazy. That's but incredible. I guess it makes sense that you had this uh, literature background, which, as as a writer, you can come up with stories more easily. Uh, I guess I became a writer because I could come up with stories. Yeah. And uh, it would be the same at the Mossad if I hadn't been a writer. But uh, may- maybe it gave me some more proficiency in, in that. Um, what they wanted to know is uh, when they give you uh, a mission like this, which you have to do in just a few minutes, what goes through your mind? There were people that started climbing the balconies. Now, you don't want that because you don't want the owner to call the police. Definitely, he won't stay with you for five minutes on the balcony. And if, even if he does, because people did that and say, my cat ran away and I'm looking for it, uh, they don't want him. They want a the creative solution. They want a creative and a solution that will not arouse suspicion. Mm-hmm. That you can... if. Usually, in, or attention. In, yeah, in real life, they won't point out uh, just just a balcony. They'll point out the balcony that uh, the people who live there interest the Mossad. Mm-hmm. So they want you to come in and to feel at ease and to make them feel at ease and to make them happy when you come again. So, uh, so they want to see how do you behave. Some people get a block. They cannot think. And they just don't do it. And if you fail in this test, you're more or less... Uh, it's not a good thing, let's say, to fail in such a test. It's not a good thing. They have, like... Uh, we, we had, like, three days full of missions from morning to night. Mm-hmm. There will be a number of missions that, you f- missions that you fail. Can you tell a story when you failed? I can tell you a story that I didn't come up with the results. Okay. For example, the instructor looked at uh, a taxi that was driving by. He said, did you see his cap number? And I said, yes, 4321, let's say. Okay, he said, in one hour, meet me here with all the details of the driver. The taxi is not there anymore. I don't have a car, I don't have a motorcycle, I don't have how to chase him. So I have to decide what do I do. So I stopped the next taxi and I told him, I just got out of a taxi and I found out that I forgot my documents there. Uh, but I saw it I, immediately as he left. So I, I remembered the cap number. I gave him the cap number and I said, do you have a solution for me? What should I do? And he said, yes, I'll take you to the uh, company right. where this uh, taxi is and uh, they'll give it to you. But until he got me there and they said, uh, no, no, you probably got wrong the number. Let me, let us check with, with the taxi drivers with a similar number. Anyway, I ended up coming back without the details of the driver. I think also they didn't, they didn't want to give me the details of the driver. They said, leave us your details. If, the, if your uh, wallet is there, we'll get in touch. And my instruction throughout these three days were never to give my details. Mm-hmm. So I came back without the results. But I guess I did the right things more or less. Mm-hmm. So. I wonder if there's just like 
an unspoken rule now in Israel amongst taxi drivers and balcony <laughs> owners. <laughs> if anybody ro- knocks on your door or comes asking about the details, it's probably a Mossad agent in training. Let them in. Yeah. Don't be a... It's probably a Mossad agent. Yeah. In tra- it's another Mossad agent in training. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, but you re- were recruited at a relatively late age. Am I wrong? No, you're right. I was recruited at the age of 35. Uh, after having submitted my uh, PhD dissertation uh, in Hebrew literature, after having published four books uh, and having an academic career already, I, I taught at the Open University. Before that, I taught at the University of Wisconsin where I got my master's degree in comparative literature. Uh, most of the people on my course were about 10 years younger than me. Mm-hmm. They couldn't be much younger than that because having a university degree was was a, one of the requirements mm-hmm. but uh, most of them just finished their ba they were uh, army officers so they were about 25 years old i was 10 years uh, older than them and that was a, an advantage or as far as you're concerned or the age wasn't an advantage and wasn't a disadvantage What I did find to be an advantage was the fact that uh, I've done a few things in my life. Mm -hmm. I've worked uh, as a community emissary uh, in the United States for about three years, and I saw how things work in another country, and it's completely different than the way they work in Israel. Uh, Then I was a, a director of a community center. As a direct result of my work, in a community center in the United States. Uh, I became a director of a community center in Israel. I, so I had some experience of that. I had the experience of teaching at the university. All these together uh, makes you a more uh, mature personality mm-hmm. and you can uh, operate or present yourself uh, for in, in front of other people in a much better way than a 25 years old guy. Can you tell us about, so you went through these trials for almost a year. Can you tell us about the day that you got accepted? Yes, I remember this day very well. Um, They told me, as they did 10 times before, in the year before, uh, just come to this and this address. And this was an apartment. But uh, this time I found there uh, nine other guys. And a person walked in and said... Welcome, you are now uh, a workers of the Israeli Mossad. So it was very exciting. But you can't tell it to anyone more, like, like it's, you got to keep it a secret. I told this to my wife. She was the only one. She was the only one also that I was authorized to tell her. You had children by then. I, I had children. I had three children. Mm-hmm. Um, my youngest child was half a year old which was a heavy burden on my wife. My oldest child was uh, 10 years old. Um, So uh, according to the rules of the Mossad, you can tell your wife exactly what you do. Um, She goes through um, um, a security checkup just like you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, if she is not trustworthy, you are not being accepted. Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason that you can tell your wife everything is that they understood along the years uh, that the things that you do are so extraordinary. Um, The emotions that you have, the the dangers that you are in, etc., are such that it is almost impossible for a person not to say anything to anybody about this, to keep it all for himself. So they decide that it's better that they give clearance to the wife. Sometimes it is to the husband, if it's a woman that is being uh, recruited. And you can tell her everything. And that, did, you, did, you, did she know that you were trying out for the Mossad? Or only after you got accepted were you able to tell her? No, of course she knew. Uh, of course, in my case. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't like this in other cases. I don't know. But... I uh, tell my wife everything. 
Uh, At what stage was she? Did do the Mossad uh, do the checkup for during, spouses uh, during the during that year? The year of uh, yeah of, of checking you out and of uh, etc. So uh, what she said is okay. You've just submitted your PhD, which you worked for very hard. <laughs> And if you think that uh, playing uh, cowboys and Indians is more uh, thrilling and more important than being a university professor, fine, it's your ball. Wow. That's, like, uh, Ethan, if your wife... If I told, yeah, if I, I think if I told Sharon that I was going to the Mossad, she'd be like, have fun, bye. <laughs> yeah, she'd divorce you that day. <laughs> well, I, she, she almost told me this uh, many years later. We served, uh, we went as a family and uh, stayed in Belgium for a few years. I worked outside of Belgium in the rest of the world, but my family stayed in Belgium, which was easy for me to fly in and out rather than flying to Israel. And uh, it was uh, 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart. And in Russia, uh, the, what used to be the KGB, became uh, another organization named the FSB, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Russian KGB. But mm -hmm. KGB was a Soviet uh, organization. Now each one of the republics had its own secret organization. And because of the perestroika and the glasnost and the, um, Russia becoming really a part of, of, of the world or of the West, um, during the times of uh, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, the Mossad decided to have uh, a representative at the FSB in Moscow, just like uh, we had at the CIA in, in, in Washington. Or, and, and you speak Russian, it's worth mentioning. Yes, I speak Russian from home. That's why they approached me. I was also in the more or less in the right rank for this. So I was kind of excited for this role of and change of events because my parents both escaped Russia after World War II, escaped to Israel. Uh, in courtesy of uh, the Brits, they spent two years in prison in Cyprus uh, because their ship was caught when they uh, reached uh, Haifa and they were transferred to, uh, to Cyprus. Um, but anyway, I thought... It's a nice turn of history of me coming to Russia, being received with a red carpet by the ex-KGB. And seeing history unfold in front of your eyes. Yeah. So I was really excited. The guy that met me and gave me this uh, offer met me in some other country where I was uh, at, the, at the same time. I told him, as far as I'm consider, considered, see it as a done deal. I'll just go talk to my wife. Now, uh, I met my wife. It was after my children already got uh, used to study in French, everything in French. It wasn't easy at all. And uh, she looked at me when I said, and I was very excited, and she said just one word, Niet. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And uh, that was it. That was the end of that. That was the end of it. But it was the beginning of an interesting book that I wrote. I named The Encounter in Berlin. Uh, and what I had in mind is, well, you know, I like Russian. I like the Russian people. I like uh, Russian uh, poetry. I like Russian literature. I know a lot about it. And uh, But what if a person in my situation that speaks German, that his parents are Holocaust survivors from Germany, got an offer to come and be the liaison to the BND, which is the, mm -hmm. the, the German secret service. Mm -hmm. and West German. Or, the West yeah. German. West, and he hates Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, what if he got an offer like this? And in contrary to my uh, story, his wife would be thrilled for him to do this because he's running around and taking risks in different countries. And here he would be a kind of a diplomat. Mm. So I wrote this book telling just this story of a person taking this job in Germany 
and the it be, it becomes interesting when uh, he gets uh, information about a group of Israelis that uh, come to blow up literally a neo-Nazi rally in Berlin, mm. and he has to turn them into the Germans. And he cannot do this. He's unable to turn Jews, Israelis, into the German as wow. a son of Holocaust survivors. And he doesn't. And from that, the story wow, runs. That's got to be a movie. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it has an English uh, translation, this book? Uh, the book itself, uh, no. Uh, but the synopsis and treatment. And okay. Yes. By the <laughs> way, I think this is a good opportunity to mention that uh, Mishka does have several books that are translated into English, which some of them, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see here, and they're available on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You want to name them just for the, our listeners? Yeah. The first one that came out, uh, came out in England and then uh, in the United States was Duet in Beirut. Uh, which tells about uh, uh, a Mossad team that goes to eliminate uh, a Hezbollah uh, official that is in charge on uh, terror acts against Israel, like Imad Mouni was. Uh, the guy that was supposed to pull the trigger didn't do it. Uh, the, the Hezbollah person... Um, it turned out that he did other uh, he ter terror acts. He yeah. continued with this. And the guy who didn't pull the trigger feels responsible and he goes back on his own, unauthorized, to Beirut to fulfill the mission, to complete the mission. His commander goes after him. And, the, and most of the book is the, uh, the fight between the two of them in Beirut. That's why it is duet in Beirut. And is it a like a physical fight? Like a... it's mostly a psychological fight, ah. but but there are uh, a few episodes of physical fight between them. So this is a book that is in process to become a movie. Ah, oh, it's happening. It's it's supposed to be happening. Okay. I don't say happening uh, about uh, until you're at the premiere in Cannes. Books? No, no. Before before the first day of of, of filming. filming. Okay. Right. So we are. Not at the first day of filming yet. Okay. Um, the 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 second one uh, is uh, Final Stop Algiers. Uh, tells about the life of a person that was uh, recruited uh, after his uh, fiance was uh, blown up uh, in a terror act in Israel. But the Mossad tried to recruit him before because the Mossad got a hold of a passport of a Canadian guy that is very, very much alike this Israeli person. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, 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 I'm an artist. He just finished Bezalel uh, Art Academy. I have, it's, it's not in my uh, programs at all. But then after his uh, fiance is being killed, he joins the Mossad. He assumes the identity of that person. And uh, much later during the book, we will find out why is this resemblance, uh, which is a v very dramatic uh, answer and, and the end to the book. Okay. The third one is uh, for, Forbidden Love in St. Petersburg, which is about an Israeli guy going to the Mossad. Uh, his wife, who is a left-wing person, doesn't want him to be involved in uh, killings. And actually, I took what happened to my wife when she met the head psychologist of the Mossad during getting her clearance. And he said, well, it's okay if he wants, as I told you, to play cowboys and Indians, fine with me. The only thing is I don't want him to take part in killings, in assassinations. I would not feel comfortable uh, sleeping with a person that killed other people. And the answer she got is the Mossad is not doing that. <laughs> I'm sure so, that uh, so, but quieted her. <laughs> when, when she came and told me about this and said, but do they think I'm an idiot? <laughs> uh, but a actually, it's almost true. Because 99.99.99% uh, of what the Mossad is doing is collecting information, recruiting people to collect information for them, etc., etc., and is not killing people. Killing people happens once every few years. Uh, when there is no other way to stop a person, either from doing terror acts or 
developing uh, nuclear uh, capacity to ra- Iranians, etc. So in my book, and this is the situation, the guy uh, must get involved in an assassination because he's the right person at the right per- uh, place at the right time. And if he wouldn't do it, Syria would have a nuclear reactor. So he does that. And his wife leaves him when she finds out. Uh, That's the first part of the book. The second is the guy, all broken, devastated, is being sent to St. Petersburg just on on a um, very low-profile mission. Uh, He has a store there. He sells things. And uh, he has to get in touch with uh, Soviet former republics that are uh, Muslim. Mm. Now, he falls in love with a local girl that dines at the same restaurant that he does. It becomes a big love story when he passes on her uh, details to the Mossad. The Mossad checks her out and said she's a spy catcher for the KGB. She is there for you. It's not that she just fell in love. You must leave her. And he says, no, 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 no. Once my love uh, life was destroyed because of you. If I have to choose, if I have to choose, I'll choose her. And from then... Very cool. Very so guys, we'll put All links. All three of them sound like uh, <laughs> page turners. We'll put links to Amazon and... Uh, yeah, and, but I want to... I got to ask, why did you join the Mossad? I mean, why? Why do that? It's crazy. <laughs> well, it's not crazy because uh, I'm a son of Holocaust survivors. Hmm. I feel the need and the duty uh, to give everything I can for the protection of Israel all my life. Uh, that's why I served uh, five years in the army. That's why I went to officer scores. Uh, that's why I excelled in what I did in the army. Um, and when I left the army, I didn't feel that I finished my obligation to my country. So uh, years later, as I said, after writing a few books and after completing my PhD, I was teaching at the university. In 1987, the First Intifada started. And I told myself, it's really not the time to teach literature. It really is the time to get involved with uh, what happens in Israel. So at the same time, I uh, conducted uh, different uh, negotiations with the army about going back to the army. And I saw the head of the Mossad and I answered them. When they called me up, I decided that I'll first try the Mossad. And that, that's why I joined. It was purely because of a um, f- feeling of obligation that I felt to this country. So what else can you, let's put it this way instead of getting into this, but what else can you tell us about uh, your career in the Mossad? Like what can you tell us? After the eight month uh, of uh, course that we did, mm-hmm. which was which was uh, operation an opera- operational course, um, I was assigned to the special operations unit. They uh, assign everyone. After eight months, they know what every person's capacities are, and they assigned everyone to a unit that uh, fits his capacities. So that's where I was sent. Um, <clears throat> for the first three years, I uh, worked uh, again as an intelligence officer because this was what I also brought with me to the Mossad. I was uh, for uh, five years an intelligence officer in the army. Uh, I became an intelligence officer of one of the small units of Caesarea. Uh, taking part, uh, collecting the information for all the uh, operations that they uh, conducted and taking part in them. Uh, Then I was uh, sent for uh, three years to to Europe where I was um, uh, 
leading a group of uh, operatives who worked in uh, mostly in Arab states. I didn't. I was their uh, commander there. Uh, I gave them their orders. I gave them the intelligence. I accompanied them, them to the airport. But I wasn't there because my cover was not strong enough. Uh, my, all my life I was an Israeli. I had... Uh, you taught in the university. People knew your face. Yeah, but that, that's not the, the, the issue. People don't know my face in Iran. Mm -hmm. But I cannot, uh, if I'm being stopped and being questioned, after 15 minutes they'll know that I'm not who I say I am. Mm -hmm. So they take people who have a much, much deeper cover uh, than me, people who spent many, many more years in other countries and can operate under uh, foreign identities and not be uh, spotted immediately. But uh, I was their controller of a, a group of uh, operatives that worked there. Uh, after those three years, I came back and became the chief officer, uh, the chief intelligence officer of uh, Caesarea, having under me a number of um, intelligence officers, each assigned to a different op small operational unit. Uh, so... In this capacity, which I led for three years, all of the operations that Isaria did where uh, the intelligence gathering was under my supervision. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I, go I had another a job. Uh, and, uh, and then my uh, daughter, my eldest daughter, was recruited. Uh, when I left for the to Mossad, the IDF or to the to Mossad the, to the IDF. Oh, uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> to the IDF. She was eighteen. Uh, when I was recruited to the Mossad, she just went to uh, um, to school for the first time to mm -hmm. grade one, and then twelve years flew uh, flew by, and uh, suddenly she was recruited. And when my wife and me accompanied her. Uh, to the recruitment center, it hit me that most of her life I wasn't there. Mm. I wasn't there for her. I didn't see her. And uh, even when I was stationed in Israel, uh, at least two weeks a month I would be abroad. And the rest of the time I would work from 7 in the morning until 10, 11 at night. So I didn't want this to be the case with my younger two children, which were uh, five and ten years younger than her, and uh, I decided to leave. The That's Mossad. 99. That's 99. And, okay, I, I, I guess there are many operations you cannot talk about. I, I do want to talk about the Khaled Marshall operation. I don't think many people nowadays who are young abroad in America know about this amazing and just mind-blowing story but before that i just want to ask about um you being a commander did you ever lose lose uh, a soldier uh, in the like did you ever have to face with one of your informants or agents being caught being or... caught or executed agents is one thing i was never uh by the way, unlike the terminology used here and generally, agent is the word we use for an enemy that works for us. Okay. For example, if we recruit a Lebanese guy that will uh, give us information about the Hezbollah, we call him an agent. Okay. Your, your people are operatives? Yeah, our mm. people are operatives or case officers, or but losing in, whatever. Yeah. So uh, agents were caught and executed. None of the people that I was involved with recruiting them, etc. And none of the operatives uh, that uh, I know, or during my time, was caught. Okay. Quite a few were stopped, were interrogated, sometimes were arrested for a few days. 
the most known story is the one you just asked me about, mm -hmm. where two of the operatives were held for a couple of weeks in a Jordanian uh, uh, prison. So let's dive into that, <laughs> uh, if, if, if you'd be so kind, just to explain our audience who, was, who is, who was Khaled Mashal, and just how did this mission came to be? Okay, but let me start a year earlier. Okay. Okay. And now I'm going to tell you a story uh, about an operation very similar that I have no idea who did it. Okay. Okay. But the head of the Islamic Palestinian Jihad named the Fatih Kaki, who resided in Syria, um, gave an order for a double suicide attack in, uh, in a place named Beit Lid, uh, near uh, Netanya, mm -hmm. in, uh, on a Sunday morning on, on where, where the place were packed with soldiers on their way to the bases. This is 96? This is 96. Mm -hmm. And, or 95, the, his, his, uh, the operation on him was conducted a year later. And um, 22 soldiers died. Many others were injured. And there was an order to, uh, to kill him, to assassinate him, because it was clear, and he came out and said that he stands behind this. Um, intelligence gathering of his whereabouts found out that he leaves Syria uh, on very rare occasions, either to Tehran or to Tripoli, Libya. To Tehran, it's a direct flight. To Libya, because of the Panam, uh, the Libyans blew up the, the Panam, uh, Pan American airplane, there were no flights to Libya. The Americans did not allow it. So he had to go from Syria either to Tunis and then go by car or to uh, Malta and then take uh, a ferry. So whoever uh, covered his movements found out that he is about to go to Tripoli. And uh, people accompanied him from Rome because there was no direct flight from uh, Damascus uh, to uh, either to Tunis or uh, of course, not to Tripoli. He went to Rome, where he was joined by Mossad agents or any other agents that went with him to Malta, so where he is staying. Uh, then he took the ferry to uh, Tripoli. After three or four days, he came back. People were waiting for him there. And uh, he was shot near his hotel and killed. Nobody was ever caught. On, the, on which territory? In Malta. In Malta. In Malta. Which, it's, it's very hard to escape from Malta because it's an island. Yeah. And, and, uh, but anyway, the assassins were never caught. And the Palestinian Islamic Jihad was wiped out. Okay. Let's leave this. I just wanted to give an example of um, an execution that went smooth mm -hmm. uh, and um, had a very good strategic results. Mm -hmm. 1997, uh, I think it was uh, on the 30th of July, a suicide bomber blew, blew himself up at, uh, at the, the market in Jerusalem. I think 18 people died. I think over 100 were uh, injured. And Hamas took responsibility for it. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was then the prime minister, a new prime minister because a year before it was Itzhak Rabin, uh, during the, um, the operation on uh, um, Shkaki, called, uh, called the Mossad, the Shabak, the army, for a meeting and said, okay, what can we do to prevent this from happening again? 
the Mossad said that since the 1992, the peace agreement with uh, Jordan, there is a, an order by Tzhak Rabin not to work in Jordan. So we don't work in Jordan. We don't know Amman. Our operatives just don't know the area. We don't know where these uh, the heads of the Hamas live. Because they were there. They were in, in Amman. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew this from general intelligence, but we didn't know their addresses, where they work, where they live, what cars they, they go, how does their day look like. So when Netanyahu told us, told us, so go there and find this out. So we went for the first time. Uh, after a week, we already had all the information needed for uh, on operation. Uh, we knew where all four of them live, where do they work, how do they move from one place to another. It's not very easy to know this because usually you cannot walk around the neighborhoods where they live because it, it's either a, a refugee camp in Jordan or, or a place where there are guards outside. But anyways, we found all this information about walking around, seeing which car is near their suspected homes and then near sus their sus suspected office, etc. We came back with the information and um, started getting ready for an, an, an operation. Then at the 4th of September, there was uh, again a suicide uh, terror act in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem. And again, the Hamas took responsibility. Then the Prime Minister called us again. We were there at his office, the head of Mossad, the head of Caesarea, and myself. We told him exactly what do we know. And he said, I want to eliminate the head of Hamas which is Khaled Mashal. The head of the snake. Yes. Let's cut the head of the snake. Yes, let's cut the head of the snake. Uh, we came up with a list where Khaled Mashal wasn't number one because we said it's Jordan. Uh, we have peace with Jordan. We're not sure it's a good idea to risk this peace. And Netanyahu said, well, I want you to find a way to kill him in a way that nobody would know there was an assassination. So here uh, we started uh, working with a certain uh, agency that can produce uh, some kind of material that if it uh, touches your skin, you die within a few hours. Um, this is just the stuff from movies. It's like you think <laughs> it's fiction and then you hear this. And it's... Yeah, wait, this is just the beginning of the movie. <laughs> Anyway, we did many, many drills of how to, how to work with this, because, of course, you can put it in his drink if, if uh, you sit near him in an, in an airport, in, in a plane, or you go with him to a bar. But what do you do if you don't? Uh, anyway, at the end, they came up with a spray. Just spray a little spray. You hold it in your hand. You, you press, and the guy feels the spray on his skin. The problem is that when people feel this, and we did this drill about 100 times on innocent people in Tel Aviv with water. <laughs> <laughs> Not the balconies, now the now people get sprayed. Wait, which of the spray bottles is the water? <laughs> and which is... The... <laughs> Oops. So anyway, pe people turn around and some of them are really pissed, pissed off. <laughs> yeah. So... We added something to the drill, and now there would be two people, one holding the, the little spray and another one holding a Coca-Cola, uh, shaking it, and in the, and, and the minute, in the second that um, the spray is being uh, sprayed, he would open it and the Coca-Cola would spill out. Mm -hmm. So the person that will turn around will not see the guy that sprayed him because he would keep walking. He would see a guy standing behind him with a Coca-Cola. Um, yeah. Just so who came up spewing with... Spewing Coca-Cola. Yeah, out. and he will... Who uh, came up with the Coca-Cola idea? I don't remember. Okay. And, uh, and there, were, there were a number of these. 
Okay. Of ideas. This is the one that was uh, uh, the Coca-Cola cho- representative cho- in the Mossad. <laughs> yeah, the lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should use Coke. <laughs> so, okay. uh, yeah, the official. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How do you call it? Of- the official uh, weapon of the Mossad. Yeah. Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was very keen of us living. Immediately, Th- this this test worked out in the marketplace of Tel Aviv. It, like people, yeah, even people that turn around with their fist, they calm down. They calm down because they An they see this this guy uh, cola spilled all all over him. What would they do? Yeah, okay. So they turn around and keep walking. Amazing. A- anyway, um, a small group of. Um, of Mossad uh, operatives mm-hmm. went to uh, to conduct the operation. I went with them as the chief intelligence officer who knew the intelligence very well. And also, who I kept the communication with with uh, uh, which it's with HQ and had an antidote which is the only substance in the world that can neutralize uh, the, the poison. The poison, because there always was a possibility that one of the operatives, operatives especially yeah. the one that uh, sprays, would, would uh, get touched by, by it. And I, you can't premature, you can't take the antidote no, before. No. You have to take it after. Yes, you can. And just for the record, the Jordanians obviously were not in the loop. No, the idea was that they would never be in the loop. They will mm-hmm. never know that there was a Mossad operation. Mm-hmm. Just Khaled Mashal will feel nausea, will feel not good, will go home, will go to bed and will never wake up. Okay, and uh, so that, that was the idea. You can say that strategically the idea of the prime minister made sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, you want to stop this chain of of uh, operation of of terror. suicide bombers of yeah. terror and this is a way to do it without harming the relations with jordan uh what happened at uh, at the operation itself is that although the operatives saw marshall coming to the office for a few days before the operation itself and there were people around, so they didn't conduct it. The, the, direc- the director of Mossad, Dani Atom, told them, uh, gave them a few uh, orders of, yeah, yeah. of how to do it. And one was that there is no one at least 20 meters to each side of Marshall. If there is someone closer to that, you don't conduct the operation. That because if two get the same day. symptoms, it would get more, like if one gets the symptom, it's... No, he, he just thought that uh, if somebody sees it ah, okay. from 20 meters, he will understand okay. what happened. Okay. So um, then finally came the day that there was no one 20 meters away. Marshall got out of the car, stepped out the stairs going into his office, uh, the two guys were standing. It, it's it's um, it's it's kind of uh, if if you look at the book, mm-hmm. you see uh, uh, a, a staircase? balcony. Oh, okay. You see staircase and you see a balcony that is is paved. Okay. Is 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 under is is uh, Which yeah. One? I, I think I think this one. No, 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 no. This one, uh, the, Beirut. the Beirut, the Beirut one. Yeah, y- you can see that. Um, you s- you see that uh, it's it's kind of um, corridor. It's a c- kind of a corridor that it comes from the street. You have to cross it, and you enter the office. Like a passage. Like like a passage. Uh-huh. This area. The, yeah. yeah. The two the two um, uh, guys that were supposed to. To, to operate the two operatives stood behind one of these uh, columns mm-hmm. so they really didn't see Marshall they, they saw him arrive and then they went behind the column 
Marshall got out, stepped out of his car, started walking, and then suddenly his little girl that no one did, no one knew is in the car ran after him. And the driver got out to to get stop her, her, to stop yeah. her. Now the two uh, operatives didn't see all that. Mm-hmm. And because uh, we didn't want it to look like an operation, there was no communication. Mm-hmm. They did not carry any communication on them. So the head of, the, of this operation, the head of the unit that stood on the other side of the street and saw all this happening, couldn't, couldn't abort. stop them, couldn't abort. So Marshall passed them, they went around him, and they conducted the operation. His driver, who saw suddenly two people that he didn't see a second before, going behind Marshall and doing... Uh, Suspicious. He saw everything. So He saw everything. He didn't understand what he saw, but he got frightened and he shouted. Now, Marshall turned around because of his shout and he got the spray into his uh, ear. ear. Then the, the story went that uh, it's a way to kill someone by spraying his ear, but it didn't really matter where it touches his mm-hmm, body. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Marshall, that was just centimeters away from the face of the guy that uh, sprayed him, got r- really afraid got hysterical and shouted and started running away. But it was too late for, them, for him. Uh, the two operatives left, according to plan, and entered uh, a car that was waiting on the next street for them to take them away. The guy with the Coke can is just standing there like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> just takes a sip. <laughs> now, well, well, if you mention the cocaine, let me tell you, don't buy Jordanian Coke. <laughs> Be- because what happened is that he, sh- he shook the, the, the Coke, and when he tried to open it, he was left with the little thing and the Coke remained. Oh, my was- God. <laughs> <laughs> but at, the, at that stage, it didn't really matter. It was too late anyway. Yeah, yeah it didn't really matter. Anyway, they went, entered the car. Um, a guy working at the Hamas office that was approaching the office at that time was out of the 20 meters uh, clean zone, uh, saw something happening, saw um, Khaled Masha running sh- away and shouting. So he looked what these two people are doing and saw them entering the car. So he took out a pen and wrote the number of the car. They got into the car, started driving, took the first turn to the right, and the driver, of course, another uh, Mossad operative, told them someone uh, wrote down the number of the car. Wow. Now, there were a lot of people there around. Uh, it's, it's Amman, it's the middle of the city, middle of the day, thousands of people everywhere. So they just told them, okay, drop us off here instead of taking them to their hotel and then checking out and leaving Jordan. So I dropped them off. Now, this uh, Hamas uh, guy, when he saw the car taking the corner, he wanted, to, he wanted to see where it goes. So he ran to the corner and suddenly he see the two guys get off. get off. So he ran to them shouting they did something to Marshall and he grabbed one of them because the other one already went to the other uh, um, side of the street side of the street now he caught one of the guy he turned around knocked him the other guy also came and knocked him and he fell unconscious unconscious the Hamas the agent. Hamas yeah. guy yeah but people get gathered- commotion People gathered around. Mm-hmm. They saw two guys that do not look uh, local hitting uh, a guy that also shouted something about Khaled Mashal. So they all g- gathered around them. All of these people in this area are Palestinians? No, but all together in Jordan, about 80% are Palestinians. So yeah. you can imagine that 80% of them were Palestinians. Mm-hmm. Maybe more because the Jordanians have uh, the, the the Hashemites have high-ranking uh, jobs there. They're not in the marketplace. They're not in the marketplace. Yeah. 
Anyway, a policeman Now, came. Now, you at this point... I at this point was at my hotel. Uh, without communicate, without updates? Without updates. So have no idea what's going on. With no idea of what's going on. Wow. That, was, that must have been nerve-wracking for you. No, but it was just like this every day. They knew where I'll be in case something happens and I will... Uh, okay. So you thought everything's going smoothly up until I did, now? I didn't thought anything. I didn't think anything because I, I just didn't know. Okay. okay. They knew this morning I'm going to be at my hotel swimming pool and I was at the pool reading Catcher in the Rye <laughs> and, uh, and, and... Enjoying life. <laughs> and waiting for someone either to come and say, okay, uh, we didn't... Uh, you have to get comfortable in that, in that space of uncertainty, I guess, as a Mossad uh, person. If you are not comfortable in a space of uncertainty, this is not a place for you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, what, what, what happened since you take me there is that uh, about half an hour later, someone came, uh, a woman that was a part of the team, Uh, and uh, told me problems. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to hear that, to say the least. We have, we have, uh, the operation was conducted, but the two guys were arrested. Because what happened is the policemen, when a policeman actually took them out of the mob and put them in a car, the mob told them, but what about this guy, this unconscious guy? You are leaving him just like this? So the policeman took him also into the same car. It's just a taxi that he stopped. They started driving away. He just wanted the two supposed Canadians to leave the place. And uh, actually, <laughs> uh, what, so, so he took them away and wanted to let them out. But then the Jordanian guy, his name is Abu Saif, wo- woke up, Uh-oh. looked at them and said, Hey, to the policeman, this is, these are the guys that did something to Khaled Mashal. Wow. And, and these are the guys that hit me. So because, because I saw them doing something to Khaled Mashal. So the policeman said, okay, in this case, here is a police station. I told the driver wow. just... It's like dr- everything that could go wrong went wrong. And much more. <laughs> and even things that, that you couldn't really imagine went wrong. Uh... Anyway, I was told that uh, the two guys performing it were arrested. I got in touch with HQ. Now you're talking about a movie. It was the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the, the eve. Uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu was at the Mossad. Uh, Waiting to hear results. No, 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 no. Ah, congratulating. Con- congratulating the, the people of the Mossad, which was gathering in the lobby. And he was on the, on the staircase uh, with Danny Atom, and he was congratulating them. Oh, and, God. And then they get a little note saying... Uh, Problems. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the two uh, guys performed the, the, oh my God. the operation, but they were caught. Talk about a party pooper. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so uh, Netanyahu and Danny Atom uh, convened, and they said, well, If they're holding our two people. Did you think about this scenario at all? No, because under no scenario, we always do uh, special sessions of... Um, Counter uh, yeah, what, what can, situation. What can go wrong yeah. from stage one? Mm-hmm. You uh, land at the airport and they don't like your uh, your passport because actually it's not your passport and they don't let you in you have one person less what do you do etc etc under no circum- circumstances could we see a situation that the two uh, combatants get caught why would they get caught i mean you don't arrest person for spraying someone Even if somebody saw you spraying him mm-hmm. right so we we didn't take this into consideration Netanyahu and uh, Yatom understood that within a few hours Marshall will die the Jordanian are holding two of our men there'll be almost an uprising of the Palestinians in Jordan and King Hussein will have to do something very radical so they decided to contact King Hussein and 
tell him, listen, it was us. If you want, we can still save the life of Marshall. If you let those two people free. So Hussein told them, if you save the life of Marshall, they'll go free. If Marshall dies, I'll kill them. Turn from cutting the head off of the snake to saving the snake. Yes. So then I got a phone call from the head of my unit telling me, uh, you still have the antidote, right? I said, yes. He said, well, in a few minutes, go down to the lobby of your officer. You'll see a captain uh, from the Jordanian uh, Muhabarat uh, security service. Give him the antidote. We decided to save the life of Marshall. So I went down. And this Captain Firas came towards me, looked in my eyes with, with, with wrath, hatred <laughs> in his eyes. I gave him the antidote. He turned around and left. I knew that now that my cover was blown, etc. Anyway, he went, they injected it to Marshall. And at that time, Danny Atom already was in, in uh, Amman. He took a private plane and went to Amman, went to King Hussein uh, uh, to, to meet him. Hussein wouldn't see him, but the head of intelligence saw him. And they were waiting to see that uh, Marshall is being saved because at that time he was uh, not only unconscious, um, slowly but surely all the, um, the, the his systems all failed. his system failed one after the other, and it was very clear that he is dying. So they gave him the antidote, and he started coming back to life. Uh, then I got a phone call, um, take a taxi, go to the, um, to, to, uh, Hussein's, uh, palace. Danny Atom is waiting for you there. And I went there. I spent the time with him because, uh, Hussein wanted to make sure that, um, Khaled Mashal, uh, is really? alive. Yeah. Uh, then when it was clear that he is alive, we... Ah, the, the, there was another point in the middle. They've also decided to tell Hussein, Yatom also decided to tell Hussein that we have four more uh, operatives in Amman. And I was ordered to go and collect each one of them from where I knew he will be in a case of uh, that something goes wrong and bring him to the embassy, which I did to each one of them. I brought them to the embassy. Uh, now, uh, Danny Atom and me, we went to the embassy. We saw them. They were really devastated. Uh, and, and you? Of course. <laughs> Except that uh, when I was traveling in Amman to collect uh, these four different uh, uh, warriors and bring them to the embassy, my adrenaline... Uh, <laughs> ran in a way that you cannot feel down. You feel very high yeah. when, when you operate like this. Um, so, and then we, we flew back. We took the flight at night. We flew back to Israel. And actually, this was almost the end of the, of the story. Um, the two guys were released. Uh, Hussein asked for... Uh, for us to do something else for the other four to let them uh, leave the the embassy. Uh, what pleased him was to release um, the leading uh, a figure, the le leading Muslim figure of uh, of Hamas that was in jail in Israel. He was released, and that's it. Actually, it was over. Ah, so they asked for more than just saving Marshall's life. Yes. And so, but if there were communication, right? I guess this was the biggest. Look, if there were communication, the, the commander in the field would have told them to abort. They wouldn't. Maybe another them. day they would try again. Yeah, and another day they might have tried again or would we would do something else. Also, when we went to Netanyahu the second time, 
we told him when he asked for a special substance, we told him, look, we know and we did operations with, with pistols, with uh, rifles, with putting a bomb in his car. We never approached him 20 centimeters from his body. Yeah. And having on us no gun, no communication, nothing that, that uh, can prevent people from catching us. Because I guess back in the day, technology, uh, today obviously it's not a problem, but back in the day... Technology was too clunky. You could not have a, 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 com- a communication uh, device without being, it, uh, yeah, yeah, seeing that you have a communication mm-hmm. device. Mm. So anyway, the, the, this was the deal. So you want a movie? <laughs> How to wow. save someone and instead of killing him? He's still alive. <laughs> he's still alive today. He's still very important. Maybe less important than back in the day, but still, yeah, still f- one of the heads of Hamas today. A, f- a few years ago, he uh, he left uh, his position as, as head of Hamas, uh, and uh, Ismail Aniya, yeah, that was the head of Hamas in Gaza, is now the head of. Yeah, Hamas. but he still holds how many. Uh, how many how many lives do you think, I mean, if you had to estimate, were lost after that because Mashal was still still around? Like, how many more lives was he responsible for in the tens and the hundreds? I don't know because I think that uh, shortly after, that in, in that uh, year of the Second Intifada, uh, about a thousand lives of Israelis uh, were taken. Then it stopped. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. And does it still hurt that we failed? Yeah, it hurts. But um, I kind of feel pleased that I saved somebody's life instead of killing him. Really? Hmm. Yeah, I cannot explain it, but. Uh, Maybe for your wife, so that she won't <laughs> won't leave you. <laughs> Did uh, duet in Beirut somehow? Was it somehow born of this? That was there ever a desire to go back? Yeah, it it uh, it was completely born of that. Uh, I described there the suicide bombing, the decision of the prime minister, uh, the collection of intelligence, uh, how we connected the car to the house to the office, etc and the execution, except that I did it with with a, a gun, not with that uh, substance. And even the little girl is there, which uh, what I did in the book is that uh, the, the object's little girl runs to him, he holds her, and the guy standing there, he's not shooting with a, with a ball, the, a pistol. The pistol is always in in uh, in a bag or something, mm-hmm. and you cannot really aim to the centimeter. Mm. The idea in the book was just shoot, and you see him get hurt. But once he's holding the 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 little baby, you cannot make sure that you hit him in the face and you don't hit the baby. Mm. So he didn't shoot because of this. So until now, this is exactly according to what happened. But the core of the of the book, and I hope eventually of the movie, is um, that uh, the guy who didn't shoot goes back to complete the mission. And and did you feel that d- desire ever to go back and complete the mission? No. In a month? No. No. The entire uh, thing of uh, killing uh, heads of organizations is a questionable issue. It's not only that uh, every leader has someone to replace him and that someone will try to prove himself by conducting more terror acts. It's not only this, which is a fact. I think that there is um, a treaty, an understanding between a government and its people that if someone kills Israelis in numbers and we have the possibility 
to reach him and kill him, we have to do this. Whether the, his deputy will be worse than him, etc. This is what happened with uh, the Hezbollah. Abbas Musawi, who was the head of the Hezbollah before Hassan Nasrallah, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, killed by Israel. And Hassan Nasrallah is 10 times worse than him. Mm -hmm. Plus we paid the, the price of uh, the, the assassination in, in Buenos Aires of the Israeli embassy and of the Amia building, uh, the building, the community center of the Jews, of the Jewish people there with 85 uh, lives that were taken in Amia building, 29 in the Israeli embassy. So uh, for, for killing Abbas Musawi. So it's, it's not the question of, is it worthwhile? It's the question of what a government must do when it has the, the capability to do, and um, the results being whatever they are. So when it was clear that we cannot bo go back and kill uh, Khaled Mashal when he was in Amman, because it was... The, the relationship with Jordan were very, very fragile at that time. And the cost of breaking up the relationship with them would be very high. So it was very clear that we are not going back for Khaled Mashal. It was also very clear that Khaled Mashal understood that we have the possibility mm -hmm. to reach him. And the, the, the number of uh, Hamas uh, uh, operations decreased. Do you miss being a Mossad agent? Not anymore. I missed during the first few months after uh, I left. I missed it very much. The first year or two, I missed it a little. <laughs> and I don't miss it at all now. The price of uh, being with my kids, uh, being with my wife, uh, family at large, uh, writing my books, uh, etc., uh, really took away the passion to go back to that and, life. And if your kid would go come to you and say, "Dad, I'm joining the Mossad," what what would you say to him? Good luck. But but also probably you can't because you just told me. <laughs> <laughs> right? Are you allowed to tell your parents? Uh, not your parents if they weren't Mossad agents. Before. Ah, but if they were, <laughs> right. then you can tell them because yeah, then I, they're. I, uh... I, I guess we we have the clearance. No, I <laughs> look this this. These were the most meaningful 12 years of my life. I don't see anything that I could do before or after that would compare. I was a, an emissary in the United States to a Jewish community. I was a head of community center. Except for being on a podcast. That's... Yeah, yeah, that's that's a completely different <laughs> the league. highlight, Dif different league. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was a director or a principal of a high school. I enjoyed everything that I did, but nothing really compares to those twelve years. J just to give more, you a touch of it, when I was accepted, I was uh, called to a meeting with the head of. Um, the recruiting department. And he told me this, we know that you wrote four books. We know that you were interviewed in the papers and on TV, and you are a bit known in Israel. So let me tell you a few things he said. The fact that you were interviewed and your picture was there, etc., doesn't concern us because nobody knows you abroad. Second, you have to know that as long as you are with us, you cannot uh, be interviewed, etc. Third thing is about writing. And let me tell you, you wouldn't write when you are with us. Because what you are getting into is so much more intriguing than your imagination. That you wouldn't even want to write. And I told myself, well, what does he know about my imagination? But he was right. I didn't write anything during those 12 years. Wow. That's okay. incredible. Thank you so Very much, Very inspiring. Mishka. Very touching. Uh, the books are available on Amazon, guys. Yes. Hopefully there will be a movie or a Netflix TV show. <laughs> Uh, if a producer hears us, they can reach out to you. Of course. Yeah, I found you on Facebook, guys. So just 
Mishka Ben David on Facebook and uh, Mishka answers apparently <laughs> messages there. So you can reach out. We'll put links uh, to the Amazon books. Thank you so much thank for you. your time. Really thank, appreciate thank it. You. And for your service. Thank yeah. you. Thank you and uh, good luck with your podcast. Thank, thank you. you. Before we go, first of all, we're sponsored by Massa. Massa Israel, guys. Check them out. Go to MassaIsrael.org, an amazing organization if you want to volunteer in Israel. Um, Make the, Aliyah, and yeah. then you, you, could, you can come here on a GAP program, academic program. You can make Aliyah, and, and then can, maybe... Maybe you'll be recruited to the Masai. There yes. you go. It all starts from Masai. Go yeah. to MasaiIsrael.org and check them out. Uh, also, Arutz uh, Sheva, Times of Israel. Um, uh, oh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm still thinking about everything that we talked about. Arutz <laughs> Sheva, uh, IsraelNationalNews.com. Check them out uh, for a great content in English about Israel. Yes. Also, AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com, the Australian Jewish News for Australian Angle. AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com. Check them out. We also accept donations. Go yes. to NJB.com slash donate because we do this on our free time if you want to help us out. That and to ah, NJB.com yeah. slash merch you can get our mugs there check them out we got great mugs we have a nice jewish boy mug and we have a bds tears mug they're great hilarious uh, conversation hanukkah starters present, or hanukkah presents yeah so check them out thank you so so much really, really appreciate it you're very welcome bye guys bye guys <laughs>